Okay, so here we go with water lecture number one. Here's what you need to do. You're going to watch and you're going to listen to this presentation, and I need you to take notes on the key vocabulary and the key ideas as you watch and listen. So you should probably pause the video when you stop to write something down because that way you don't miss the next thing that is being brought up. Inside of this presentation, I've inserted some check for understanding slides that clarify what you should have learned. So that way, oh, you can tell if you miss something and you can back up the video and you don't have to go back through the entire presentation to figure out what you what you have missed. Now you're going to have a quiz in this material during the next class period. Those check for understanding slides, I guarantee you are going to be on the quiz. So if you get to a check for understanding slide and you don't understand what the answer is to a question or a, a definition for a term back the video up through the last you know minutes before that slide and make sure you have that in your notebook okay so we're talking about the water cycle we've talked a lot about what water does going up in the sky and forming clouds then we get precipitation and it falls when precipitation falls it hits the ground it can only do one of two things Water that hits the ground either goes into the ground or it moves across the surface. That's it. I mean, water doesn't magically disappear. So when it hits the ground, if it sits on top of the ground, it's going to go into the ground or it's going to move across the top of the ground. We're specifically starting our discussion with that water that's in the ground. It's water that fell from precipitation that then moved into the ground. We'll do the runoff stuff after we finish talking about the water that goes into the ground or our groundwater. Now, this is important because we know there's eight times more groundwater than there is water on the surface. First of all, first term, infiltration. Infiltration is just merely the process of water going into the ground as opposed to moving across the surface, which is what we call runoff. You can see my little experiment here. I took a cup of water and I poured some water into the ground right here. And you notice it didn't slide off anywhere. It went into the ground. Now it's still a little damp. It's still infiltrating, but that's the process of infiltration. It's water that goes into the ground as opposed to moving across the surface. So, some water goes into the ground and some becomes runoff. It's not like an either or kind of thing. It's like both happens every time it rains. So what determines how much goes in the ground and how much becomes runoff? It's primarily determined by what's the ground like. Is it steep or is it flat? Because, you know, a steeper ground, the water is going to slide off quicker. If it's flat ground, water is going to soak in quicker. But the bigger variable here is what is the ground made out of? What is the ground like? And that's going to lead us to these two, these two terms. Ground that is porous has many openings in it or pores and, and, and water can get in there and hang out because it's got a lot of space to get in there. Being permeable means that you allow water to pass through easily. If you think about biology, you remember that permeable or semi-permeable membrane. It was something that, that would let things pass through it. And when we talk about water, permeable means it's something that allows water to go through. Some natural materials look like a sponge. A sponge has a lot of pores in it. You can see it's got a lot of openings in it. And you know sponges hold a lot of water because they got a lot of open space in there. You also know sponges are permeable. Water goes straight into a sponge right away. But some natural materials are kind of like our tabletops in the lab where they are solid and there's no open space in there. So water can't go into it and because there's no space for it to go in in the first place. So let's talk about some natural stuff. We're going to look at granite and slate. We're going to play around with these rocks. 
Granite and slate are both rocks that don't have a lot of openings for water to get in there, and they don't allow water to pass through it. They are, they have very low porosity. There's not much space, and they're low permeability. They don't allow water to go in. You look at granite. I mean, it's just rock solid. It's just everything's. I don't see any holes in granite. And even if you used a microscope, you wouldn't see very many holes in a piece of granite rock. This rock here is granite, and you can see when it rained on top, the water doesn't go in. It just kind of sits on top. It'll basically sit there until it evaporates. So granite would have low porosity and low permeability. Now sand. Sand, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. Sand's got lots of open spaces in it, and it allows water to pass through it easily. And it holds a lot of water. And think about this, if you've ever been to the beach and done something like this, playing with a sand castle and you try to make a moat around your sand castle, you pour water in the sand, it goes in almost as fast as you can pour it because sand is very porous, has lots of space. It can hold a lot of water and it's highly permeable. Water can go into it very quickly. Some rocks underneath our feet look kind of like sand. They're even more porous. You can see all of these openings in these rocks. Look, it means it can hold a lot of water. It also means that the water can go from one opening to the next, usually fairly quickly. So water can move through rocks like this fairly easily as well. Now clay, on the other hand, clay is highly porous. It's got a lot of open space. Clay can hold a lot of water, but the spaces aren't very well connected. So that means the water doesn't go in very quickly or easily. So if you think about clay, think about it, the situation over here. You know that when it rains, the water kind of sits up on clay and clay stays muddy for a very long time. And that's because clay can hold a lot of water, but the water doesn't drain through it very quickly. So something like clay was gonna, is going to stay wet and muddy a long time because it's highly porous. It can hold a lot of water but it's not very permeable. The water doesn't move through it very quickly. So here's our first check for understanding. I, I did this kind of earlier than I normally would, but I just want to give you an idea of what you're looking for. What are the two things that water from the sky will do when it hits the ground? It's two choices. If you didn't get those, you can back up. And our two new vocabulary terms are permeable versus porous. All right, so rain falls and rain hits the ground and we know rain is going to go into the ground. Unless it's just absolutely solid rock, we're going to get some water that goes into the ground. And if it rains again, you're going to get more water following right behind it. Well, remember, water doesn't get created or destroyed. We have a very finite amount of water. So the water is going to go in the ground and it is going to collect. This is why you can dig down on the ground and you can actually hit water because the water gets down here and it's eventually going to collect, especially if you go deep enough, you're going to hit rock like that granite that I just showed you. Just like the previous picture where the water would sit on top of the granite, here the water goes through the ground and it hits the granite and it starts to collect. And the ground here will fill up with water. So this is actually a pretty accurate depiction of what's going on there underground. At some point, the water, sorry, the ground is going to be full of water. Now, this part of the ground up here is not full of water. So when it rains, the water can go through that ground and becomes part of this collection down at the bottom. Now these have names. This is called the zone of aeration. Think of aeration like air. There's air spaces in there, so water can move through it. The zone of aeration is soil that is not full of water. On the other hand, the zone of saturation is the part of the ground where it is saturated or full of water, or all of the air spaces are filled with water. And the point at which that starts is called the water table. So the water table is the point where the ground begins to be full or saturated with water. 
So what if it rains more? Or if the ground allows more water to come in? So, you know, I got my water table is right here. And then it rains a lot. We have a really, really rainy season. And more water comes in faster than water gets out of the ground. That means it's going to fill up and keep filling up and keep filling up. The water table isn't one spot. It can move up and down. If it rains more, the water table is going to go up. If it rains less, the water table will go down. Remember, the water table is wherever that point starts that the ground is saturated with water. So big ideas about the water table. This is a kind of key idea concept is the water table can change. And the water table is different in different places. Now think about that. The water table depends upon the rain. Does it rain the same everywhere? We know that's not true. So that means the water table or how far down you have to dig to hit water is different, different places. Some places in the desert, you might have to dig down a long way because there's just not much water falling to go into the ground. Other places, you can put one shovel in the ground and hit water. Now, if you hit water underground, if you hit that, that, that area of saturation, and it's a big area that is saturated, we call that an aquifer. An aquifer is a usable collection of water underground. By usable, I mean, you know, there, there's enough water down there that it makes it worth it for me to go down there and get it. Now this picture here on the right, most time when you see an aquifer, that's kind of how they draw it. I don't want to give you the indication that it's an underground lake. It's not. It's not a big open cave under the ground that can be filled with water, although you can have caves underground as part of an aquifer. An aquifer is just some place where the ground has a lot of usable water in it. So if we think about a rock like this guy here, that could be what we have filling in this space. But because the rock has so many holes in it and it's holding so much water, we could call that an aquifer. So once again, an aquifer is a collection of usable water under the ground. So let's talk about that water table thing. He said it can go up and it can go down. In Florida, it rains a lot. And the ground is really flat. It's real sandy. So the water goes in the ground very easily. The ground in Florida is very wet. The water table is very high. Some places you can dig a well with a shovel. You and I can go out in the backyard and it wouldn't take us very long at all to hit water. People in Florida can't even have basements because the water table is so high. So if you tried to build a basement, the water would just seep into your basement and you'd basically have an indoor swimming pool in your basement. In New Orleans, the water table is exceptionally high. Because remember, New Orleans kind of sits below sea level. It's, it, it's already lower than the water level outside of it. New Orleans is so low and the water table is so high that when they bury people in New Orleans, they don't really bury them in the ground. They can't because they would hit water too quickly and the coffins would float up out of the ground. So they build crypts for their cemeteries. They build these watertight uh, vaults that are above ground because the water table is almost at the surface there. We have places around here where our water table will get really high. Big Creek Greenway. A swamp or a wetland like the Big Creek Greenway is a place where the water table is almost all the way to the surface. And when it rains really hard, the water table comes above the surface and we wind up with what you see there. Now, after it stops raining in this picture, the water table is going to go back down, but it's still going to be really close to the surface. So another check for understanding. You see the new vocabulary and a couple of concept questions. You either have those in your head and understand them, or you can back back up in the video and record those. So this whole thing about groundwater, why is it so important? Why do I care? Well, Here's what makes groundwater special. Groundwater is clean water without any of that stuff that surface water can have in it that makes it unhealthy for us to use. We 
all need water. And think about in the days before modern technology, you wanted to make sure you had clean, safe, healthy water. Think in the old pioneer days. In this area, you would maybe go down the Chattahoochee River and get your drinking water. Here's the problem with getting your water from a river or a lake. Farmer Brown up the river from you takes his cows down to the river to drink and they drink in the river. And while they're standing there, they, peep in, they pee and they poop in it. Well, you live down here somewhere and you take some water out of the river and it's got cow poop in it. Make you sick, spreads disease, you could die. So surface water isn't nearly as safe to drink as groundwater. In addition to that, forget animals, in medieval times, before we had really good indoor plumbing, people used to pee and poop in a chamber pot, a, a, a bucket per se. And then what they would do is they would dump it out the window and they'd have like a little gutter going down the street. And when it rained, the rain would wash all that nastiness down the street and wash it into the river, which meant major city rivers were not safe enough water to drink because they had way too much bacteria in there. They didn't know this in medieval times. It's one of the reasons why they people drank ale and beer so much in those times as opposed to drinking water because ale and beer was fermented and it was brewed and it killed all the harmful bacteria in it. Whereas you couldn't drink the river water because it had all this nastiness in there. Even to this day, you still can't trust river water. You and I can't go down to the Chattahoochee River, which is a very clean urban river. You wouldn't see a picture like this in the Chattahoochee, but it still happens places and it still doesn't stop animals. You, know, you see the geese flying overhead and you've seen the geese in the river. You won't want to drink that water directly because it might be contaminated with fecal matter from animals. So we can't trust surface water, but there's no plants or animals or bacteria or pollution deep underground. The only thing that can get that deep underground where the groundwater is, is the water itself. So that means that if you can get to it, you know it's going to be safe, good water. It won't make you sick. So towns in our country, especially as the country grew west, grew up around places that had good sources of ground water, which begs the question, how do you get that water out of the ground? That's what these things are for. These are wells. A well, by definition, is a man-made access to groundwater. It's where you dig a hole and you go down there and you get the water. You've seen stuff like this. You get the idea. You, you drop the bucket down in there and you crank it up and you bring up water. This is another example. It's called a pump well. You would pump this handle and it creates a little vacuum and then the water comes out right here. Both examples of hand wells. This one's a little bit safer because it's not open. It's a covered pipe. Probably with a well like this, it could get contaminated. If a bird flew overhead or flew down in there and tried to drink water and then it pooped in there, you could have some contamination. Not nearly as much as drinking water from a river, but you get the idea. You know. Some other examples of wells. People used to build what they call step wells. If you found a source of groundwater close to the surface, you would want to make it accessible to people. You want to let a lot of people get down there because everybody needs water. And instead of waiting your turn to crank the bucket, you would maybe make the hole bigger and you would make these stairs or ladders. People could go down there in groups and get the water that they needed. The largest hand dug well, this is a little bit of kitschy history. This is in Greensburg, Kansas. In the 1800s, they figured out there was some, some uh, water close to the surface and they dug down 109 feet and they dug a huge well in the ground. It was a huge source of water. And at the time, they were looking to get the railroad to come to their town because the old steam engines, they needed water to make steam. And they said, hey, look, we got this big well here. Come, you know, bring the railroad to our town and you can have all the water that you need. And you'll never run out. Here's what it looks like today. It's a tourist attraction. You can, you can walk down there to the bottom. Most old 
towns still will have a spot somewhere around there where there was some what they call community well. You found a good source, a uh, clean source of, of groundwater, and you let everybody in the town come to that spot to get it. This is the town of Bishop, Georgia, over near Athens, and the old community well is still there. You see, this one says circa 1890 is when this particular one was drilled. So anybody in the town could come here, and it was their access to get good, clean groundwater. Now, you don't see these a lot anymore. Like, you wouldn't find any in metro Atlanta because we have modern sewer systems. And Atlanta's had a, had a public water supply for a long, long time. So the old wells, they were torn down and, and covered up. Here's one that's still in use, though, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin the Prior Avenue well. And you can see a sign right there. Please reserve for persons drawing four, uh, drawing four or two gallons per turn. People still go to this well and they fill up containers with water and take them back to their house, even though they have indoor plumbing. Indoor plumbing, water that, that is treated and comes to your house has chemicals in it. And some people are very averse to putting those chemicals in their body, chlorine, fluorine, so forth and so on. Or they just like the taste of the water that comes naturally out of the ground. So some of these old wells are still around and still in use. Here's one I saw in the center of Kusadasi, Turkey, which is a very old city. I mean, it goes back to medieval times and people still needed water back then. And as I was, I was on a run this, uh, uh, this day and I'm running along and I just came across it and stopped, take some pictures, look at it. I tasted the water. I couldn't tell you how many people came by and got themselves water from this well. It's still there. It's still safe to drink. Here's a little bit more of a classic looking well. This was in Mykonos, Greece, a little Greek island. And, uh, you know, it goes back to ancient times, ancient Greeks. And I was running and, and I came across this. And I said, oh, look at that well. And you can see there's a, here's the rope down there. And I went and looked in it and there was a, there was a bucket down in there tied to the end of the rope. You could you know, put the bucket down in there and get yourself a bucket of water and pull it up. And I looked at it and I thought, well, man, this is ancient. I mean, this thing hasn't been used in a long time. There's still water in it. But while I was standing there, some people came along and they actually got some water out of the well and then took it with them, which kind of surprised me because it doesn't look very, uh, very safe and very clean. But you get the idea. When I was in Vietnam a couple, couple uh, two years ago, there's this Bale well. And this little town of Hoi An grew up around this particular well. And because the ground is different in different places, well water might taste different from one place to another. This well is thought to have a very particular taste and it gives the noodles cooked at some restaurants what they think to be a particular taste. So there are some restaurants around here that will send one of their employees to the well and get a jug of that well water and that's what they cook their noodles in because they they think the well water gives their their particular noodle dish a specific taste now this is what a modern home well looks like now right you know around here in roswell nobody's got a well or not many people anyway because we're, we're in the city and we all have pipes that come to our house we've got a big river right down the street but here's some cases out in the country where you might be miles away from the river and, and, and you're miles away from other houses and there's no water lines coming to your house. So what you have here is you have a well house and it's not the old crank bucket or anything like that. If you open it up, it looks something like this. This is a hydraulic pump and it pumps the water out of the ground. And I see this line here goes to the house. It takes water straight out of the ground and runs it to your house you typically protect your well because that's your source of drinking water. You don't want it to get damaged or destroyed. You don't want a tree to fall on it in a storm. You don't want, you know, a, an animal to, to come and mess with it. So people tend to put their well heads, their well pumps in little buildings like that to protect them. And if you go out in the country, you'll see them. Here's the mobile home. And then over here, you notice a little brick house and that's where the well is. Don't see them too often here in Roswell though. So here's how it works. And it's real easy. It's a simple concept. It's sticking a straw in the ground and you basically just suck out the water. 
Now you'll have a filter on there that will help keep any uh, particulate matter like you know sand or dirt or anything from coming up with the, the water. So when you turn on the pipes in your house, it, it's just water that comes out. Here's our zone of aeration. Here's our zone of saturation. And here's where the water table starts. The problem with wells are they're taking water out of the ground right here. In the area around the well, the water table drops because you're taking water out. Now over here, the water table stays in this spot. Because you take it around like sipping a straw that has multiple openings in it, you get what's called a cone of depression. Notice there's a cone shape around my well that is dry. The cone of depression is the area around a well that dries up. So when you make a well, you can't just go to the water table and stop. You've got to go even deeper because you're going to dry up the land around your well in that cone of depression. Notice this area back here behind me. You can tell by the view it's very, very dry and brown. I'm in Utah. It doesn't rain very much here. It rains very little at all. But if you'll notice here, they're growing corn. And corn is a very thirsty vegetable. It takes a lot of water to grow corn. So the question becomes, how can they grow corn here if it doesn't rain very much? Well, here's your answer. If it's not falling from the sky, they must be getting water from up under the ground. This right here is a good example of a well. It doesn't look like what we think of with a well where you've got a hole in the ground and you crank the bucket down there and scoop up water. This is what most modern wells look like, especially the ones that are found on farms, which is what most groundwater is used for today, and that's in growing crops. There's our pipe and it goes hundreds of feet down there under the ground and it brings up the groundwater and it sends it through these pipes here and sprinkles it on top of our corn and that allows our corn to grow. Remember that most groundwater use in our country is for growing crops. Now, you don't see a lot of these in Georgia because in Georgia, it does rain enough. You're gonna see these more in the middle part of the country where there's a lot of farmland, but not as much rain. So they make up for the lack of rain by getting water out of the ground. Now, because those those wells, they, they move around that center pipe, you get these weird shapes of fields out there in the west. They tend to be circles. And if you're flying in an airplane going west, you'll see these. You won't see these too much in Georgia, but as you go west to where it's drier and they have to use well water, you'll see them. Now, remember that collection of water under the ground, the big collection of water is called an aquifer. And in the middle of the country, we have one of the biggest, most important aquifers. It's called the Ogallala Aquifer, and that's named for a town in Nebraska that's kind of over here in the center of the aquifer. And it's a huge collection of underground water. If we took all the water out of it and spread it over the United States, we'd have about a foot and a half feet deep puddle of water. If you took all the water out, it would take about 6,000 years for it to fill back up naturally. And we take a lot of water out of that. 90% of the water that we take out is used to irrigate, irrigate our crops. $20 billion a year of food production relies on that aquifer because it doesn't rain enough there. They have to pull the water out of the aquifer under the ground. And we got some problems. Lots of wells take out lots of water. And remember, every time the, the, the straw, you suck on that straw, that water table is going to go down. So there's what happens. It's just like a soda at a fast food joint. You suck out all the water. If you don't refill it, it goes dry. But just like at a fast food restaurant, generally you can go up to the refill station and you can refill it. Well, the same thing can happen with an aquifer. If it rains a little bit more, well, then the aquifer will refill. But you have to be careful to not drink or take more out than you're refilling it with.
And that brings us to these concepts of groundwater recharge, and that's, that's the rate at which water goes in. The discharge is the rate at which we take water out, whether it's natural or people. The balance, the aquifer water balance is simply the difference between the two. It's how much you have going in versus how much you got going out. If your balance is negative, it's like a negative balance in the checkbook. You're, you're spending more than you've got coming in, and that's what happens with these aquifers. The balance for the Ogallala aquifer is now negative. We know the water's coming out faster than it's being put back in, and people are trying to figure out, well, how fast? How, how quickly is it going to run out of water? Because that's the aquifer that grows the majority of our corn in our country. So we don't want to see that thing run out, and some extreme estimates put it as early as 2028. There's another problem with that aquifer. It's been in the news a lot, and that was the Keystone Pipeline, and that was – a proposed method to transport oil from Canada to Louisiana and Texas, which is where they make oil into gasoline. The problem was they wanted to bury that pipeline under the ground, right through the aquifer. And pipelines are notoriously leaky. And if you leak oil in the ground and your aquifer is in the ground, you get oil in your water, which would contaminate it and cause a lot of problems, could make your water unusable. So as you can imagine, people in this part of the country were very resistant to the Keystone Pipeline coming through because they didn't want to take the risk that they would contaminate their very important aquifer that is used to grow our corn in this country. Now for us here in Atlanta, not a big deal. We got a nice big river right next to us. Here's, here's the Chattahoochee River. Always got water in it, rains a lot here in Atlanta. We don't need wells and groundwater as much because we have a nice big water supply. That's why you won't see a lot of those types of wells that I showed you water in the corn because if you plant corn in Georgia, it's going to rain enough on it to, to keep it growing. Almost every place in Georgia is close enough to a river. I mean, look at look at these rivers, and these are just the major rivers. I mean, there are, there are enough rivers in the state of Georgia that everybody can get their water from a river. You can lay a pipe to it and draw water out of the river. So groundwater in Georgia isn't used as much as it is in the West where it doesn't rain as much. Now, here's a map of major U.S. aquifers, and you notice that under Atlanta, there isn't one. If you were to start digging a hole and wanting to drill down till you got to water, you would not hit a very significant aquifer underneath us. There's water down there, yes, but just not enough to call it an aquifer. And the reason is not because it doesn't rain a lot here, because it does. The difference is we're on top of granite, and I showed you a picture of what it looks like when water rains on top of Stone Mountain. It just sits on top of the granite. It doesn't go in very easily. So if the water doesn't go into the granite, it means you're not going to have water in the granite. And therefore, we don't have an aquifer in Atlanta. So wells here in Atlanta are not very popular because you just don't get enough water down there because there's not a big aquifer. Now, South Georgia and Florida, their ground is a little bit softer. They're not on granite. They're on more sandy and clay, but it still rains a lot. So people down there use wells a lot more often because there is a lot more groundwater for them to go get. Now, nationally, 87% of the people in our country now get, get their water from a pipe from a, from a, a, a water company. Only about 13% of households get their water from well, gets, get their drinking water from wells anymore. Now in 1950, it was about 30% of people still used wells. But as our country has become, you know, has grown and technology has gotten better and cheaper, more and more people are getting their own plumbing from, uh, you know, water companies. Most of the people that, most of the groundwater that is taken out of the ground today is used for farming, not for people's houses. Now, there are some states that use a lot of groundwater, California, Texas, and Florida especially. The reason why those three use it so much, they all, they can all have growing seasons that are a lot longer because they're very far south, and they have a lot of agricultural products that need water. California, doesn't rain in California. We know that. 
yet they grow crops like crazy because they have year-round sunshine, but the crops need water, so they have to get the water out of the ground. So this is our final check for understanding. You see the list of vocabulary. You have some ideas or some concept questions that I'm going to ask you to explain, and they'll be expressed as a, you know, in a multiple choice format. So at this time, you need to upload a picture of your notes that you took in order to get credit for your daily grade today. And we'll have the quiz the next class period.